discussion being swamped by the AI discussion? Uh, I would say yes. Um, I think the AI policy debate is such a waste of time right now and such a distraction. This is um, the OGM call for Thursday, June 1st, 2023. Conversation obviously already in progress. Um, so Mike, I've, I've never yeah. heard of the declaration and it was just a year ago? Yeah. And as I say, they got about 62 countries to be part of it. It was uh, on the side of the summit of democracies, huh. which got a little more attention, but most of the attention was bad attention because people were asking why some of the countries invited qualified as democracies. Yeah. Uh, may you live in interesting times. Can I just say that? We certainly do. We are living the curse. <laughs> Digital policy is a growth industry. And possibly uh, lifetime employment, although that seems like an oxymoron phrase now too. Um, cool, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling the Jones for just diving into a salon style squishy discussion around these topics sounds great to me. If somebody doesn't, uh, uh, isn't intrigued, suggest a different path to us, uh, but we can go to a check-in round next week. Uh, it feels like there's a whole bunch of this stuff that's hot and we might be able to, I don't know, I'm just feeling optimistic, uh, take a look at it and sort of range it, frame it uh, so that we don't ignore the dangers, but we also don't get uh, sucked into the, the vortex. Uh, and the maelstrom and ignore all the other stuff that's possible. Um, sound okay? Sounds reasonable? Okay. And uh, the, the, I wish the women of OGM would be showing up uh, right around this time. I am missing, uh, I'm feeling the imbalance. Um, that's a recruiting Koyana, failure on our part. Koyan Eskatsi, Life Out of Balance. Um, actually, I wanted to read a poem. Uh, I, I'm on the poem of the day thing. And this morning's poem was by Audre Lorde and is <clears throat> is actually really kind of um, really topical. So uh, the poem that I was interested in reading is titled A Litany for Survival by Audre Lorde. I'll put a link in the chat right now so you can follow along if you feel like it. But let me just uh, read that as an opening for a call. A Litany for Survival by Audre Lorde. For those of us who live at the shoreline, standing upon the constant edges of decision, crucial and alone, for those of us who cannot indulge the passing dreams of choice, who love in doorways coming and going, in the hours between dawns looking inward and outward, at once before and after, seeking a now that can breed futures like bread in our children's mouths, so their dreams will not reflect the death of ours. For those of us, us who were imprinted with fear, like a faint line in the center of our foreheads, learning to be afraid with our mother's milk. For by this weapon, this illusion of some safety to be found, the heavy-footed hope to silence us for all of us, this instant and this triumph, we were never meant to survive. And when the sun rises, we are afraid. It might not remain when the sun sets. We are afraid it might not rise in the morning when our stomachs are full. We are afraid of indigestion when our stomachs are empty. We are afraid we may, may never eat again. When we are loved, we are afraid love will vanish. When we are alone, we are afraid love will never return. And when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it is better to speak, remembering we were never meant to survive. which seemed oddly apropos. Well chosen, Jerry, thank you. Uh, the serendipity in the world chose this one for me. Uh, and I, 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 it turns out I already had it in my brain. I already had it marked as a possible poem to share, but it showed up in the stream. Um, and Lord is a really interesting character. I, I would love to know more about her. Thanks for posting the brief bio, Pete. Um, Mr. Carranza. Um, 
our, uh, oh, I should keep the hand raised, I guess. Are reactions to this encouraged, allowed, or? Reactions to the poem or to the topic? Yeah, yes. To the poem, yeah. Go crazy. I have just been learning about something called CPTSD, or complex post-traumatic stress. Um, basically, when growing up in uh, a situation where, you know, there's basically constant stress, um, as, especially in childhood. And the poem kind of speaks to that a bit. Um, and the survival mechanisms get de in developmental um, the nervous system and the brain, they develop differently from a child who's raised in a safe environment. And so, you know, hypersensitivity and, and too much adrenaline is something that, you know, I can do as my check-in. You know, I haven't been focused on the world because I've been focused on, you know, the whoever I am to, to basically say, ah, you know, I'm, I'm kind of been healing and hit like, okay, I'm surviving, but I'm not thriving. And, you know, I've, I've been through a crisis. I'm kind of out of the crisis, but I'm still in community, relationship, world, um, national, international crises. And it's kind of like, huh, I want this world to thrive, not just survive. And, and you know, I had a wonderful conversation about um, what we're doing here. And Yes, we're talking with each other, but are we a community? And what does that mean to become a community? Um, you know, I I would love to talk to each of one of you, each one of you, for say like an hour a week. Um, but is that a community? Um, and you know, but kind of like where are we going with this? Um, and should I be here? You know, that's that's a, that's you know a question I'm asking. Thank you for the poem. I love Audre Lorde. I love Adrian Rich. I love any number of uh, of modern um, poets, as well as you know, William Blake <laughs> and Lao Tzu. And you know, this um, poetry can change the world. Um, but I see a lot of ignorance and rejection of of the figurative as opposed to the quote unquote rational and objective. And that, you know, false choice. You can either have one or the other. You can either be a poet or a scientist. That just doesn't work. I remember, I'll make this very short and I'll use this as my check-in. Um, going to Xerox Park and meeting one of my heroes and trying to become an artist with working with Xerox Park. And he asked me what kind of art I did. And I said, well, I'm a poet. And I didn't say I was an erotic poet because that would have been just ridiculously, but I've never seen someone's face go from admiration to disgust so quickly. And he turned and walked away. Damn. Damn. And so, you know, I've, I've been to a lot of art and science groups, but um, anyway, um, I apparently have a, infected maxillary sinus and need surgery so wow woohoo I, I don't have any symptoms but apparently if you leave it untreated it could lead to blindness or meningitis and brain and or death. poetry or poetry but you know brain and brain infection you know it's, it's a it's a chronic infection damn um hooray for health hooray for you know western medicine um apparently this is not going to be treated with acupuncture or or uh anything but uh um yeah i wish i could say that um you know i'm gonna go to d web camp and i'm involved in this you know idea for basically making the internet a less creepy and more human place but no i'm at home i'm kind of uh, um on a leave of absence just kind of focusing on moving from surviving to to thriving how do i how do i get back to some kind of contribution what am i able to con contribute and where um is the place i'm working right now the right place anyway thanks for listening and uh um thanks for letting me reflect on the poem thanks for the poem thanks mark um two quick comments before i pass to stuart 
One is thank you very much for pointing out the nesting of traumas and how as you deal with your own personal world of, of stress disorders or whatever else and then step back into the world and look up again, there's just a series of nested traumas you get welcomed by. Uh, outside, which is just a, uh, it's a drag, but, but it's, we're, we're, I think a, a thing that attracts us to these conversations is that we're concerned about these traumas in lots of different ways. Uh, but we have a, a deep sense, not only that there's these traumas around us, but that there's a path out. I think, I think partly we're here because we're, we're optimistic, um, which takes me to the a quick second thing, which is my favorite model of community, uh, which I learned from Scott Peck back at a workshop a long time ago. I just posted a link to the description and Peck, and this has really stuck in my head. Peck says most communities are in what he calls pseudo community. They think they're a community and you could name them as a community. They're, they're a particular congregation or they're Jeep drivers or whatever. Um, but really when push comes to shove, most of them would just leave. And the thing that causes communities to fall into communities, he calls chaos, which is the second step, which means some incident happens that drops the community into chaos and they have a bunch of choices to make them leave, which is like there was there was no community. Gosh, there was nothing here. Um, appoint somebody to just leave like, ah, this is really uncomfortable. Or um, the third stage uh, that he describes in his path to authentic community is emptiness or emptying. And it's, a, it's not quite group therapy, but it's very much like, Man, when you went to go kill that bee, my heart was in my throat because I'm a nonviolent person and I like to save insects. And that was that really got me angry. And then we were off to the races. But it, as as people in the in the in the group uh, start to relate, uh, what what start to empty themselves of some preconceptions and biases, you then might get to tr authentic community, which is the fourth stage. And what I what I kind of like, but but what scares me about the model is that it seems to suppose that authentic communities are all hardened by fire. They all need trials by fire. And I'm unclear that OGM has had its trials by fire. We've certainly held the mirror up a bunch. I don't know that we've solved the things when we've held the mirror up. Uh, we've had a couple of incidents here and there uh, that were hard on us, but not forging kind of incidents, and we haven't created a lot, though we've created some things. And any of you who've been on the myriad sort of uh, ancillary connected conversations, I feel like we're making progress, but not everybody feels like we're making progress. And I think that might be a piece of it as well. So anyway, the, I offer up uh, Peck's community building. He started the Foundation for Community Encouragement, which was kind of the host for, uh, for that uh, definition of community. Uh, with that, off to Stuart, then Mike, then Stacy. Yeah. So thanks, Jerry. A few, um, <clears throat> a few uh, related thoughts. Um, one, um, art versus science. <laughs> Think about the highest level of science. It's all artistry. Think Einstein as a as a, a kind of a, a classic example in terms of where his thinking went to and his, his spiritual pronouncements later in life. Um, two, Scott Peck, um, the road less traveled. Um, most people get the quote wrong. Um, <laughs> most people think of the quote as um, many are called, few are chosen. No, the actual quote is many are called, few choose. Uh, I remember having a realization at one point in my life that um, one of the reasons that I was um, <clears throat> felt so challenged was because I chose to follow a spiritual um, slash um, out of the box um, path in my life. And it was, you know, out of the normal, out of the normal kind of societal um, conventions. So many are called few choose. And the idea of choosing has got something to do with what um, Mark raised, the notion of um, trauma. Um, if you think about you know, epigenetics, um, it's not just the trauma of childhood, <clears throat> but it's the trauma of the environment that we're living in. And I think we're all living in a PTSD world right now. It's just part of the fabric of where we are. Um, so you've got to pick and choose um, what it is that creates an island of sanity for yourself. And I think the potential saving grace of the world is to have all these little islands of sanity 
of which there are many thousands percolating all around the world to start to um, populate, to start to attract, and in some ways to start to become an alternative um, society to what is going on in, in traditional spheres, which obviously are not working and uh, are leading us uh, over a cliff. I have spoken. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks for saying a lot in a very short time, Stuart. Um, I just had a few few things to, to share and a few questions to ask. Uh, first off, thank you to those of you who are on the pregame show and gave me feedback on the declaration for the future of the internet. Um, that's one community. There's a whole bunch of policy wonks who are trying to make uh, the internet more people-centric. Another community is meeting next week in Costa Rica and also online. That's a four-day gathering of the RightsCon group. And this is a conference that's been going on for at least eight or nine years. Uh, usually it's held every other year in the Bay Area, but they moved to Canada when Trump's visa restrictions made it tough for some of these people to get into the States. Um, and the the um, the other community that I'm very involved in is the Internet Governance Forum. But my my question for the group is: communities are great because they connect people to each other. So even if you know all of us don't meet more than every week or two, I can call up Jerry. I can call up others of you and get get advice, and we can build on that. But the real power is when we leverage the rest of our communities to do things. And unfortunately, I see a lot of communities, particularly ones that are involved in internet policy, who, who aren't ex inclusive. You know, they're, they're kind of, we are the self-appointed community and, and the RightsCon community is a good example of, you know, we are the people who spend 100% of our days thinking about protecting freedom and fighting censorship and internet shutdowns and surveillance online. And they, they don't see beyond their worldview. And I'm, I'm sensitive to this with RightsCon because I've been to a couple of the meetings and I, I would sometimes be the devil's advocate and stand up and say, well, you know, that's very ideal of you to say that every company should spend twice as much money as they do today to meet your needs. But have you considered the other needs they're trying to reach and the other things that money could be spent on, whether it's connecting more people or providing better cybersecurity? You know, why is your need so worthy? And they get really upset when you do that. So my question for the group is whether you've been in communities that that do feel that they have some exclusive uh, right to be heard and that you know, they don't need to reach out to those people that they don't want to hear from. And and I'm not saying all the rights con people are like that. I, and it, it's, I mean, it, it, the people who are broadest and, you know, most involved and most influential know the value of reaching out. But there are, within many communities, people who don't want to be open to other ideas that, that they oppose. So, any thoughts on how to be a diplomat and push open doors for communities that don't want to actually listen to others? And also, if anybody has any thoughts after reading the Declaration for the Future of the Internet, I'd, I'd welcome that too. Thanks, Mike. And if anybody's got responses to Mike, just step in the queue, please. Uh, Stacy, whenever you want to step in. Thank you, Mike. Um... Just in response to your question, I would say we should leave that as a question and start that as a fresh thread. Um, I just have a few related thoughts. Home is where your heart is. Wherever you go, there you are. John Cabot Zinn. Fear resides in the amygdala. So I forgot who was talking, Stuart, I think, was talking about the islands of sanity. So I see myself more as a butterfly. So I think about lily pads. 
So the lily pads are where I jump from step to step. And those are my communities or islands of sanity with people that I've decided I resonate with. And that's how I can move to where there's more or less resonance depending on where I need to go. And I'm not sure if that makes sense, but you're welcome to ask me questions maybe at another time. And the last thing I'll point out is that leaving is a flight response. And that's not necessarily a bad or a good thing. It just is. And thank you. I'm complete. Well, no, I'm not. I'm never complete, but I finished my thought. Oh, well, there we go. Yeah. Doug, whenever you want to step in, but take your time. Uh, Doug, which one? Oh, sorry. Uh, Doug C, because I just realized Doug B is on the call. Thanks for noticing. Okay. And I've got a plane flying overhead, so it's hard to hear me. But uh, sometimes the history of words tells us something really important. And the word community, the co we all know is wood, but the immune part comes from an old, old root uh, for to move. So it seems to me that people that move together have a better chance of being a community than those who just gather in a place together. And it's an interesting thought about whether a community is about place or about pe people. Um, so munus, which is part of the root, is a gift, duty, or service, munide. And it comes from me, which is to exchange, mix, or bind. Uh, I'm just going to do a really brief screen share because I, I agree with you, Doug, etymologies are hugely important. Um, and so here's com communication, municipalities, remuneration, <clears throat> communis, uh, and community. Here's community. But uh, munus goes back to me, which is Proto-Indo-European to exchange, mix, or bind. Um, so I think there's, there's interesting takes on, on the shape of, of the word and its meaning for us. And Ken just posted an etymology as well. From etymology online. Thanks, Klaus. Whenever you want to step in. Yeah, I, I think the the maybe other way of looking at forming community is based on shared intentions. Um, because I'm, I mean, I'm, you know, as you know, I'm, I'm working in the regenerative agriculture, uh, what we call now a movement. And, you know, I had an interesting experience going to the Al Gore uh, climate reality training camp and became a certified, you know, certified uh, the climate uh, you know, partner there. And to my surprise, you know, Al Gore didn't have anything to say about land-based solutions or about agriculture, which just blew me away. Um, so I engaged you know, with the group and, and I got onto a mailing list that uh, includes all the chapter leaders in North America. And they were very gracious you now engaging with me. And I, I shared with them you know, the, the who else is already all working on um, farm bill related uh, issues on issues related to um, uh, you know, regenerative agriculture, working with farmers, working with markets and so on. And this is, these are all links that they didn't activate here, but these are all links leading to what these groups are working on and the declarations they have made. And the amazing thing here really is that the Kiss the Ground organization has partnered with the American Sustainable Business Network and consolidated dozens of NGOs who never talk to each other um, to, to arrive at an aligned policy. You know, what are the core issues that need to be uh, addressed in order to, to change the trajectory of our engagement with nature. And that is huge because the food system is, is obviously you know, enormous. Um, 
so I'm giving a presentation to them on Saturday um, about the basic needs you know, to to shift and change. And the the and so what I what I really want to emphasize and stimulate is let's let's have our intentions aligned. You know, and intentions are based on the on a shared understanding of the information, a shared acceptance of what um, of what is the science, what is the reality, you know, and, and so on. So I, I really I really think community in is is um, is based on intentions um, more so than than um, um, than, than anything else I could I could think of you know, because once once you have passionate intentions, then then um, you are more willing to listen. You know, you're more you're more willing to engage and put your yourself aside. So that's at least has been my my observation and and uh, um, so we'll we'll keep we'll keep moving forward because the 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 you're really dealing with two worlds. You know, there's the industrial sector and, and BlackRock just came out uh, announcing that 90% of their shareholders are pushing back on including sustainability and environment uh, and social issues into their investment strategies. Now that's a $7 trillion fund. And then, you know, so, so there's that world of profit maximization and short-term thinking. And then there is this increasing alertness in in many parts of the population who feel exposed to risk and and uh, a a future that is increasingly uh, uh, challenged. And so these two forces are, are colliding in ways that is really historically unique because. Uh, in most any other country in the world, it would get suppressed you now. And, and here the expressions are free, but the actions are still uh, you know, inhibited. So anyway, sorry, random thoughts. Good random thoughts, Klaus. I just want to step in for a sec. Um, one of the things that leaps out at me from what you're saying is how the right and the far right have created sort of laser-like collimation of energy. So what makes laser light cut through things and normal light not is a, a phenomenon of the alignment and amplification of light waves. And uh, so it, it was called being on message or message management back in the day. And Newt Gingrich kind of in, imposed this discipline. And if you stepped away from the messages that were being circulated on the far right, you would not get funded for your next primary. You would get you know, you would basically get dumped out of the party. And they did this in a way that led to a whole lot of legislative victories, even though they often represented minority positions if you were to take a big vote across the country. And that's still happening right now. And progressives and scientists and others, except for on a couple issues like, hey, climate change is really happening. Look, we all signed this thing. But progressives have, and by the way, these are thorny, wicked problems that we're all facing, but we all have so many different alternatives and so many different initiatives that that collimation doesn't really happen. And one of the things I'm really interested in, see you, Mike. Uh, Mike had, a, had to leave at the half hour. Um, one of the things that I'm really interested in is, is it possible to preserve the diversity of efforts and opinions, but somehow create a collimation of energies in the middle uh, so that the same forces felt in the public sphere for efforts to get things done? Because, because there are so many different initiatives, some of which are, well, we should have cows on the land. No, we shouldn't. Cows are terrible. Cows make methane. Ah, we should have nuclear, thorium reactors, pebble bed reactors. No, we shouldn't. Nuclear is terrible. It costs, it costs you know, too much for everything. I, I'm, I'm in a whole bunch of these battles on mailing lists around different groups all the time. Happens constantly. And these are incredibly smart people. These are world authorities on the subjects who can't seem to agree on things. And I think my question to this group in, 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 in general is not can we resolve those questions definitively and like settle those, damn it, and the people who disagree about cows just back down, but rather can we find a way to bundle up and augment our, our collective energies and try everything and use some kind of 
experience, experimental, data-driven method to work our way towards solving these different things, which are difficult, dangerous, interrelated, and messy. Um, and, and I don't know that that's, that's possible, but I'm looking for that. I'm looking for the thing that causes the energy to connect up. And so I love movements. I love, I think movements are really interesting because movements sometimes pick up a whole lot of steam. Occupy came out of nowhere, uh, shut things down for a while. It got a lot of attention and then dissolved. And I don't think it dissolved entirely. I think Occupy caused a bunch of these groups to get together and get to know each other and start to collaborate in ways that they hadn't been collaborating before. That's a plus, but but so many big issues. Um, yeah, I think we should focus on people who disagree about cows, Mark. That's that's the key. Um, Doug B, floor is yours whenever you'd like. Well, I'm sorry, Mike. Mike had to leave, but it's really in response to his request. Um, and I've experienced the, that silo effect for the last seven years. Um, and I'd love to, it's actually not a meta level, it's more of a proto level. I'd li like to drop below the fray of all of the silos and all of the attachments to sort of a, a different center of inquiry, which is what's the consciousness question? All of the silos and all of the solution searching and all of the fray around data and around technology and around um, you know, coming up with manifestos and laws and rules and, and codifications um, are all nouns. It's all about things that are by definition fixed and static. The whole IP tradition in, in Western law is about a, a fixed representation, something that's written and locked in stone and then owned and protected. And um, the shift in orientation, the shift in awareness and consciousness, just to sort of lean toward an indigenous orient an indigenous reference, is toward verbs, toward the dynamics and the flows in reality, by and between everything. So it's not just a human-centric question, it's a how do we, with this thing sitting on our shoulders, relate and orient everything in front of us, whether it's problems or whether it's dynamics or whatever it is, good, bad, or indifferent. And it's sort of like God gave us this higher level cognitive function. And it was a gun in the hands of a bandit. And um, the focus and preoccupation with solving things with us as the source of the solution and solving things centering exclusively in the mental body, which is abstraction, which is intellectual, but is also not reality, they're constructions. <laughs> and they're constructions of our making. So, um, if we could somehow shift weight from a thing-oriented, intellectual-oriented, solution-oriented, sourced from us-oriented to a sensing feeling being more balanced mix across all five bodies, across all of our sensorial capacities, but also in acknowledgement recognition of everything being interconnected in reality, everything affects everything else in a dynamic living way, that consciousness shift would make a big difference. In order to do that, <laughs> and this is the 3000 pound gorilla in the species, in order to do that, it means a sort of global letting go and releasing of attachments to our constructions to our solutions, to our intellectualizations, our abstractions, our things. 
Because if I'm busy filling my attentional bandwidth with my own baby, my own construction, my own salvation for the world, I don't have any receiving capacity to tune into others, nor to tune into the rest of the living biome and planet that we are living on. I'm really in a box of my own making. So I'm just to sort of walk on the wild side. I'm suggesting that maybe um, instead of staying in the abstraction rabbit hole of our species, that um, maybe if we got really practical solution oriented in what would affect our actual relationship with the reality around us. Um, what would it take to achieve a quantum consciousness shift from where we are, if this is where we are, to here? And I would argue, and the reason it is sort of a rising up is because the indigenous, which is what here represents, never lost connect with the living interconnectedness of everything. And their consultation and all of their decision-making in response to their experience of their world is to source like what's okay and what isn't. It's really a binary kind of thing. The Kogis is an indigenous tribe. Whenever they make a decision or whenever they are confronted with whatever in the operating of their community, they turn to an oracle and an oracle turns to a cup of water and reads bubbles and whatever, but whatever channel the oracle is tuning into, they go, yes, that's an alignment with source. It's good, good to go. Or they say no. And if it's a no, then that, that governs, that's it. And their reference is to reality. That's really what's going on there. They're referencing, but a very complete awareness and consciousness of the reality they're in and a sensing feeling into con consequences of what they may or may not be about to do. It's a really fundamental, primitive, simple calculus when you shift to that awareness and orientation. And with that, I'm complete. I apologize for the length of that. Is it possible to make a direct comment or should I just wait in line and comment on Doug's later? I'm happy to do that. Um, I'm torn. Um, if you can, if you can remember what it is and stay in the queue, let's 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 go queue, and I think that'll work out fine because uh, Kevin's been patient for a while. So let's 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 stick with the queue and and just um, make a note to yourself in the chat or wherever else. And <coughs> that'll work out fine. Thanks for asking, Mark. Kevin, whenever you want to step in. Yeah, I, I posted in the group of uh, my comments to our Tourism Development Authority here in Asheville, uh, where there's a, been a group that's trying to get, uh, it's a crazy thing, our industry is growing so much that the 6% occupancy tax has grown from 18 million to 40 million in the last uh, four years. And it's governed by nine people who worked in the tourism industry and then one representative from the county and one from the city. And they, the only restrictions are that it promote tourism. So they can actually channel it to things at their venues, uh, especially if it equals you know, uh, heads and beds, which is the metric of their tax. And so we, we got this local and private bill through the legislature of the state that lets 16.5% go for the good of the community. And there's a group that's had a really good campaign. Uh, oddly enough, there's a really efficient group here called the Democratic Socialists. And their chapter is really efficient. And then the food and beverage workers are really good about things. And so there were 40 of us yesterday at their meeting and we sat through 56 minutes of their meeting. And then they said, well, we have four minutes left. Will one of you like to speak? And our organizer said, no, we've sat through your long meeting with 20 minutes from consultants about bad feasibility. He didn't say that. Uh, can, can you listen to us? And they did. And I, I was the one who spoke about the business case for affordable housing because people aren't showing up to work and there's high turnover and all those things. But people, the, this food and beverage workers spoke up really well. 
And we're feeling pretty confident that we might get about 7 million for affordable housing and that carve out and that one service worker will be on the board of the lift fund, which is the carve out fund. And then separately, I've been working on this, I mentioned here, this farm to table uh, watershed fund where we just, we have money for the first two loans. And these are zero interest loans like Kiva, but for local farms, uh, similar to what slow money is doing in their Bitcoin. And we're gonna do it through benefit dinners at local restaurants for the farms that they brag about sourcing from. And the restaurants are okay with that, they can do that. And so we're gonna do the engagement there. And then we've got a thing hooked in where there'll be a little table tent on the table so that the diners who are part of, you know, your meal is being donated to the farm that will keep your free range or arugula on your plate. And then you can also give to a group called Equal Plates that buy at market rate and serve these organic meals to places where people can't afford it. So senior centers and head starts and schools and poor neighborhoods and stuff. And one of the things I've seen repeatedly is that if you hit up um, kind of your farm to table eco liberal with guilt at the point of consumption, they will typically give to for folks who can't afford what they um, what they're doing. And so anyway, we got the funding to to launch that uh, yesterday. Well, yesterday. So anyway, we're going to launch and see how it works. But there's a real divide between uh, the farm to table folks and the folks who can't afford it. And so we're trying to bridge that along with giving this low cost funding. So anyway, both of those happened uh, in the last few days. Yeah, it's pretty decent. That's fabulous, Kevin. Thank and thank you for telling us about it. So Kevin's um, story and sharing was a great example of an island of sanity. <laughs> where, where, where people are doing some same things. So it's a wonderful, uh, you know, kind of bridge in the sense of what Doug was talking about, about a shift in consciousness. Um, in 1993, I wrote an article called Silver Foxes and the Art of Resolution. It was published in the um, California State Bar Journal. And it was about the ideal of people coming together with disparate viewpoints and being able to engage in dialogue and come up with some rational solution uh, to address a real live problem. And unfortunately, some of the PTSD we live in is a result of the legal culture becoming litigious in the US and exporting that around the whole world. And it's it's so far from the kinship, um, indigenous ways of dealing with problems and justice and criminality. But we've created this huge us versus them, winning at all costs, um, right, wrong, fault, blame, um, and it's, it's at the foundation of all ills. There's no dialogue. Um, our media perpetuates this because it sells. You know, um, argutainment um, sells. Um, so that's kind of at, at, a, at a core level of why there's no real dialogue between um, human beings solving real problems. Um, when I was doing a lot more work um, with individuals um, in the area of resolving conflict. The first thing I did was address the human aspect of the relationship before moving into addressing the practical kind of business um, aspects of it. And when you get people down into their own emotion, um, the human capacity 
of loving, of compassion. Um, if you provide the container in which that arises, um, people are just absolutely amazing. But you know, most people are not working in that um, in that arena, and that's kind of the essential place that I think we need to learn how to go to. And I say learn because it's a conscious choice of, of moving into that space and operating in that way. I um, want to give another shout out to what Kevin's doing, um, which sounds like actual community. And you know, certainly, you know, all politics is local, which everybody generalizes. I don't think all politics is local, but um, but it starts there in terms of you know actually being a citizen with actual face-to-face -face contact with people. Thank you, Kevin, for what you're doing. I think it's a really good, really um, nice thing that I heard from you. Um, I posted in the chat. So I'll kind of go up to it. Um, uh, Doug, I'm often confused by what you say. Now, I'm happy to be passionately confused about it um, and engage. Um, not, not a criticism, just kind of an inquiry. Um, uh, still scrolling up here, Doug said, in alignment with source and talked about indigenous people. Now, as somebody with possible Aztec or Toltec heritage and you know, our Super Bowl was basically chopping off 3,000 to 10,000 heads and putting them on, on stone poles. I really mistrust, if not distrust, indigenous wisdom. It, it's kind of in my blood. Like, you know, to do divination, you take a stone knife, you know, somebody on mushrooms or peyote, you cut their heart out, you hold it up to the sun. We don't do that. That's not indigenous, you know, wisdom that has moved into our current um, civilization. And I think there's a good reason for that. And it's, it's really, it, 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 it raises my, I hate to say this, bullshit meter. Because bing, pegs it um, when I hear about indigenous wisdom. Because, you know, they drove many large mammals to extinction um, easily. Um, but one of the big things was how are constructions not reality? I mean, we could say that the dollar is a construction and it basically occupies, you know, this chunk of our brains and is growing bigger and bigger and bigger, um, as well as advertising and, you know, everything that comes with, you know, this construction. But we can also say that language is construction and continues to be a construction, continues to be a process. So I'm very passionately confused. What is unreal about constructions? Because we are here in a construction. I'm looking at a reality one pixel deep. My voice is being converted into digital stuff over a wire. It's going out to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, uh, what, 13, 14 people. And then in the recording, it'll go out to how many different people um, who watch the recording? Um, and it might last, outlast my lifetime. What I'm saying right now, somebody's ability to hear. What's unreal about that? Thank you. Um, and you know, I don't want to derail the conversation, but I want to make that really interesting point in a, in a, I don't know, philosophical or even artistic or, or objective reality reasoning way. Um, we, as humans, build tools and as do the indigenous people um and i don't know you know you said you know is this um in a box of my own making in alignment with source in the indigenous way different from say what the um amish or mennonites do and say do we want this in our community and choosing together at a particularly small scale Whereas I don't have any control if, you know, you guys use the internet or not. I can refuse to use the internet. But yeah, maybe I can't anymore. Can I actually live without a cell phone anymore? 
um, when people are moving things off of, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm losing local stores. Um, you know, Fry's was like my nerd temple and it's gone. Radio Shack gone. I can't get a capacitor without using a keyboard and it irks me. Thank you. Actually, I can. I can drive to uh, um, Menlo Park or a wonderful electronics store in, uh, uh, I forget. Um, electronics Plus well. in Centerfell. Yeah, or I could go there. I don't know that one. Thank you, Ken. Oh, see, um, Centerfell. Thanks for listening. Sorry for Link. Uh, not at all, Mark. And th thank you for opening a lot of bountiful questions. And you opened one in particular about indigenous ways of knowing, which I am a big fan of, which is a huge topic and which would make a delightful topic for a future OGM call. I think that maybe we should just uh, drop that into uh, into our, our schedule and say, hey, let's go let's go address this and figure out what we think and what we mean by this, because I, I think that's great. And then Doug brought in the question of, gosh, we could try to ration, rationalize our way through this and solve problems and talk about nouns, or we could talk about relationships and connections and consciousness and find our find some other way uh, to find this collimation that I sort of am asking about. And I think that's an interesting topic for a future call as well. It's like, hey, we are Western critters very much raised in the tradition of, uh, you know, we'll science the shit out of this. And uh, that doesn't always work very well. Um, so, uh, Stacy, whenever you feel like stepping in. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'm glad Mark mentioned the phone because I haven't had one in about a week. And um, in some ways, it's good. I don't want one. But, well, actually, before I go there, I want to just channel a little bit of Ken into a new dimension, because instead of who is this we that we're talking about, I'd like to ask, who is our? Because I keep hearing our, and I don't know. Okay, um, need for technology. Okay, right now without my phone, the biggest problem that I'm having is finding my keys and my eyeglasses, which I just ordered new ones, new eyeglasses this morning after I got back from the farmer's market um, and had my coffee and Stacy, who is our? That's for Stacy to know. Well, Mark is um, just taking notes from what you're saying. Yeah, no, I'm just, thank you, Mark. Um, so anyway, but here's, my, here's what's really important because this is my community. So who is our, I'm here. So right now I'm part of our. What I really need that if I had a phone, I could do it in a second with my eyes closed, but I don't. Just very simple. I need technology. I need the simplest thing, the kind of keypad you have on your door where you just punch in the numbers to get in. It's so basic, so easy. I haven't been able to reach out to any of you to say, can you get me something just for my building, just for my apartment as a prototype? I have. I have so much ready to go in so many different directions, but I need somebody to work with. Everything else is all in place. And I, who is it? Somebody here asked, oh, Barry. All right, Barry's not here, but he always, he always brings up the question, do you eat to live or live to eat? Thank goodness I live to eat because I love eating and I have been eating so wonderfully. So I just, with that, I'll, I'll stop. But please, if somebody could just, just very basic, dot, 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 dot. And by the way, I have the banks that I could see from my window. Well, not the banks, the major companies that I can see right from my window are M&T Bank, Verizon. I have Orange and Rockland. I have everything here, please. I don't want to lose. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten locked out of my house. That genuinely has been my biggest problem, getting locked out of my own home. So please help me. I'm com I really am complete now um, for today. Thanks, Stacey. Thank Thanks. you. I, I yes. didn't hear, I tried to listen, but I didn't hear the exact ask for help. The ask is if you can set me up with secure with a security system 
for my home to put in a basic security keypad for my house. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, I do have another question. Is anybody going to that Costa Rica thing that um, Mike talked about? Because I have somebody that has a place there. Nobody. Okay, well, if you hear of anybody, please. They, I can be reached through email. I can be reached through Facebook Messenger. That's it <laughs> for now. Cool. Thanks, Stacey. Thank you. Um, so where does this put us? Maybe people who haven't checked in yet. Sean, Michael? We're sort of not doing check-ins, but I'd be happy to oh. hear from people who haven't spoken yet. Yeah, we're not. We, I didn't start us off in a, in a check-in round. I just started us off on a topic. Uh, we're freewheeling a little bit, but it would be lovely for anybody who's been participating to step back and anybody who hasn't had a chance to talk to step in if they want to. Process question. Yes. Um, I uh, There was a woman who uh, was interested in this discussion. I said this would be a check-in thing, and she said, I got a sort of today. I'm not going to show up, but um, are we still kind of alternating back and forth? We sort of are, except we're slightly varying from schedule. And I was going to talk about that with the group as well, like what we want to do with with uh, with our time, because we went through some really interesting conversations about that. I think two calls back. Um, so we might might test that out. Uh, but I came for right in just now, a couple. I came in just a couple minutes late, and uh, I can't tell what the topic is. Can you refresh the topic for us, please? Um, so we started in. It's funny. We haven't really stuck to the topic that much. We started in on the pretty large and growing debate about AI is going to kill us and all those kinds of things, uh, like the, the swirling eddies of what are the effects of and how do we manage uh, all this excitement about generative AI. That's where we started, and we clearly haven't uh, haven't stuck to that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm quiet for anybody else who'd like to step in. Go ahead, Ken. I just going to say I'm looking at what do we mean we Kimasabi, and I think of that in terms of AI. Uh, we will have AI soon, and who is we when we have an inorganic life form uh, in our midst? changes the dynamic quite a bit. Um, if anyone is interested, I can give you a copy of um, uh, James Lovelock's latest book, his last book, Novacine, where he talks a lot about uh, AI and um, what he calls cyborgs and the future of, of life on the planet. It's an amazingly uh, powerful read. It's, it's relatively short. It's very accessible. I learned learning a lot about earth science. And um, he says the, 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 the project for both humans and uh, artificial intelligence or what he calls cyborgs will be keeping the planet cool because if we go above 50 degrees centigrade it's game over for everything um, and that ties a whole bunch of stuff together so if you want a copy just ping me and I'll be glad to send you one it looks like I haven't uh, finished reading it I just kind of dipped in a little bit but it looks really interesting and useful so thanks Ken uh, Klaus whenever you would like to yeah, I'm. I'm. Um, I, I don't think AI is going to kill us. I think nature, if anything, kills us. It will be the natural world. Uh, so when you when you listen in to the oceans uh, acidifying and warming and uh, uh, challenging the, the its capacity to produce oxygen, for example, um, that's a big deal, you know. And so AI is a tool that we could be using to uh, come together and find out, we'll find ways to um, to protect ourselves. But I think we are completely parking by what is actually really um, an existential challenge. It's not AI. No, I mean, it's, it's really our relationship with the natural world. And I'm continuously baffled, you know, because I, I'm so immersed in in this, and I'm, my algorithms are uh, 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 channeling, you know, all this science data, and and it's just like overwhelming, nasty, <laughs> negative stuff all day long. Um, but we are really in a in a really bad spot, you know, 
And I had a conversation yesterday with the, with the local climate tech uh, uh, meeting here. Yeah. And these are all folks working on different aspects of you know, technology related to climate issues, uh, energy systems, agricultural systems, and so on. And I, I finally felt compelled to say, you know, are you aware of a very basic statistic? We are, we are drawing 1.8 times the regenerative capacity of the planet. And that is expressed in we are overdrawing the aquifers. You know? uh, the rivers are running dry because we are overdrawing that. The, the, the soil is depleted, which means we are you know, disturbing the water cycles. <clears throat> um, the oceans are I mean, so, so there is a drawdown of minerals and resources. Fish stocks, for example, we are pulling fish out faster than they can reproduce. So the fish, so 90% of global fish stocks are in stages of collapse. So all of that combined adds up to 1.8 times. And there is, an, there is a website, it's called uh, over, overshootday.org, where you can look up, you know, they're, they're tracking this stuff. Well, if you take 8 billion people and divide this by 1.8, that's 4.4. You know, that means the carrying capacity based on current consumption patterns, that's 4.4 billion people. Now, if you apply a Western diet and lifestyle to that, that now comes down to something like 3 billion people. I mean, just process that for a moment. So we, we are drawing down the ecological capital of the planet while we are increasing our demand on it currently, which is why drawdown you know, is this big, uh, the idea behind drawdown is we're drawing down which means we are accelerating uh, exponentially towards a state of collapse in the natural world. <clears throat> that's just basic math, right? I mean, that's just, that's just uh, and it's, uh, yeah, my, my wife is <laughs> telling me, shut up, I can't take it anymore kind of thing. And you, don't, you really don't want to hear that, but that's where we are at. You know? And so AI, you know, I mean, yeah, lots of issues with AI, but the, the core problem is we could use it as a tool to help people understand, right, to make the information digestible, palatable, and so on. Instead, we're focusing on can you weaponize it and what can you do with it to you know, make the world a bigger mess than it is. So I'm sorry, just my disturbing tendency to continuously dwell on looking into a future that uh, is just amazingly uh, uh, scary to me. Klaus, thank you. I was in a conversation yesterday uh, where I was like, we were well on our way towards destroying ourselves before this generative AI stuff showed up. Um, and then Rai shrugs and we moved on. Uh, Doug, did you have a quick comment on that? Uh, not too quick, but maybe fairly quick. I'll try uh, to be short. Um, picking up on what Klaus was saying, I did a painting a few weeks ago that I've been unwilling to mention. And it shows a big red brick building with a big entranceway and a line of people waiting to get in. And on the top of the building in big bronze letters, it says Federal Suicide Center. And I'm thinking that uh, yesterday I was in a conversation about the dangers of starvation. And are we in a world where we have to figure out how to end ourselves? That was definitely not a light comment. Um, thanks, Doug. Sean, uh, whatever you want to step in. Um. I'd, just a quick response to Doug first. <laughs> I, uh, I'm a Canadian, and uh, there's a there's considerable debate going on in Canada at the moment around uh, the um, what is it medically assisted, uh, what is it intentional death? What is it called? Uh, made M A I D, uh, but basically state assisted suicide, um, and um, and there is. Um, there's evidence that <laughs> that that people who are falling off the end of the economic diving board are um, are finding themselves um, 
um, drawn to made as a solution for their turmoil. Um, I would just like to uh, to say hello again. It's been a while, a long while since uh, since I've participated in these calls, and when I did, it was not uh, it was not enough in dying. Thank you, Jerry. Um, um, I'm uh, I'm going to have at the very least a, a summer of sufficient calm to uh, to be able to uh, to participate with a bit more vigor and um, and so I would just like to say hello again and um, and introduce myself as as a developer who a software developer who is working very vigorously on uh, attempting to construct um, basically scalable. Uh, sense making technology um, with a with a strong <laughs> orientation towards scalability where I, I mean not not so much um, uh, hard, um, uh, software scalability as rather the scalability of participation of many humans, um, which is the real issue and challenge I would submit. Um, and um, uh, anyway, so just a gentle hello for the moment, and um, uh, yeah, I'd be delighted to communicate with anyone who uh, is is interested in such um, pursuits. Tom, um, thank you. Um, Pete just typed into the chat what I was about to sort of say to you. <laughs> um, I think we have some conversations that that were what your what your quest is would fit beautifully, and uh, we should do that. Thank you. Thanks for rejoining. Really appreciate it. Mr. Carranza, whenever you like. Um, Sean, I think you and Jerry were at a, uh, um, what is it, virtual Memex meetup um, about a year and a half ago or so, a year or two ago. Associated with the archive? I'm sorry? I associated with the archive? With whom? With, uh, sorry, archive. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I, oh, archive. The, uh, were were you seated in the basement of the archive or some such? Yes, that's uh, it, uh, yes. we call it the um, what is it called the uh, the church the the temple the um, the crypt the science, no. what's it called science temple it was the um, yeah. uh, Sunday school um, area where the kids would go while the adults um, who <laughs> basically never got Western health care were slowly dying <laughs> and leaving the church to other uses um uh so there's one way um basically we can refuse western medicine or not afford it or or basically go haul in in western medicine and, and let it um iatrogenic um is a wonderful term about basically um how healing um can basically kill um but i just wanted to point out our friend um uh, Jonathan Swift and his modest proposal. Um, uh, also, our friend uh, oh, uh, Thomas Malthus. Um, you know, I I I wonder about war and uh, plague, starvation, famine, the four horsemen. Um, Klaus, we might be in luck <laughs> with, with very quick depopulation and you know demographics, um, the carrying capacity of the earth will. Um, hopefully recover. Um, you know, look on the bright side. That was the play, Mrs. Lincoln. Um, there's some dark humor. Um, and I'm asking myself the question. Um, you know, I've studied AI since 1984 before, um, and it's gone through many changes. And, you know, the definition of AI is what we don't know how to do yet. Everything else is engineering now. Um, but certainly, you know, the wealth and power disparities, you know, the people who are able to afford um, AI and, you know, Bill Joy's notion about, you know, desktop um, pandemics uh, being created. Um, I heard a wonderful thing this morning about older people who basically, you know, can you say America was better or, you know, the life was better, you know, way back when? And it wasn't better so much as um, 
different where there were different risks. Your, your risks were kind of known risks. And now we have a lot of unknown risks and a lot of uncertainty causing a lot of angst and even more, uh, oh, what was the thing in the 50s where people were, um, you know, death of a salesman, where people were kind of dissociated from society, dissociated from, you know, what um, Doug Breitbart was saying, reality. Um, you know, what is reality when you're selling widgets and working for worldwide widget and, you know, you got a green widget and your widget with tail fins and it's all bullshit. Um, you know, that's a great question. I don't know how to answer it. Um, not so much random musings, but uh, um, there is this notion where in AI, the people with the largest computers win. And, you know, many people have talked about this um, uh, because of the chemo and possibly age of chemo brain. Um, I forget names very quickly or easily. Um, apparently that's common as we age. Um, but the big guy with the dreadlocks who plays lots of instruments. <laughs> <Darren Lanier. laughs> Thank you. <laughs> He really talks very much about, you know, AI is taking what humans do. It's searching through all this data that they slurp in um, that we've created. And it makes very, very subtle and really important mistakes. Um, and people like the Chinese and the Russians don't mind in rumor letting AI run things without a uh, human in the loop to kind of say, okay, AI proposes this, let us decide whether this makes sense or not. Let's just have AI do it, it's cheaper. That scares the heck out of me. And I don't know, you know, when Klaus was speaking about, you know, the soil and, you know, the real, um, difficulties of, of planetary warming if there's a distinction without a difference um, because you know things that are incredibly complex like um, the electricity distrib distribution network the grid I mean there are so many things like you know traffic and um, the economy that are just so far beyond both human and AI control that the effects of positive feedback um, are really, you know, existential risks that we can't quantify. Yet. And, you know, that old saw, what you can control, what you can't control. Um, when it comes to planetary level issues, the stuff that we can't control I'm not sure how we deal with that in spiritual connection with the earth, with each other. Um, and I just want to say, yeah, um, uh, what Ken said that we have, you know, to share with uh, like non-human life in a, in a way or technological life. It's not life. It's certainly not life. We use life as a metaphor, but it's certainly not life. Um, and that's a much deeper discussion. And welcome to uh, Gil. It's just uh, popped in. Um, and his Fathom partner. Thank you. Full Fathom 5, my father lies. Bye-bye. That's right. Got whatever you like. There you go. Anybody want some good news? Yeah, yeah, please, dish. I mean, are you guys sure? Because I'm, I, I'm never sure. I could totally go for it. Because it gets awful, awful bleak around here. Um, and I am a believer that you can either look at the bleakness and say, let's just, might as well just go down, end it all. And like, really? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not in favor of that. So I had something happen um last week it was completely unexpected but it is it ties back to what i think 
was going on when this group was originally formed. Um, the concept of drip, 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 just keep putting things out there. Um, repetition, repetition, repetition leads to reputation. And I made something a couple of years ago, three years ago, maybe. I called it the play pledge. And it was just me saying, hey, we should play more. We should be more playful. I think that, that people underestimate the value of that. Um, and yet, if you look at what people do with their spare time, that's what a lot of them do. They're looking for the point when they can play, play more. I also look at play as an interaction between people. It's not a game on a table. It's, you know, there's an invitation, there's an acceptance. There's a set of constraints, there's an intent. It's uncertain and there's some skill involved. So that's that's what I look at when I think about play and, and what, what games are. So what happened was that's been sitting out there for a couple of years with nary a peep. And I got an email from a woman in Mexico City who is part of a group called Teach for Mexico in Seña por Mexico. And she said, I found this. I would like to translate it into Spanish because it perfectly articulates the posture that we would like to have our students and teachers um, act out. And I was flattered, floored. Of course, I said yes. And I asked, I'll tell you what, you, you translate it. And because I'm a designer, I will make it into graphics with your logo and colors in the formats that you want. You know, tell me what, what works for you, slide, poster, um, uh, social media post, whatever. So ended up having a conversation with them to talk about it, where a number of my other philosophies resonated. And wow, all I did was put a positive, I thought, hopeful message on a little web page. And now I'm connected with an organization in Mexico City that is going to use that to help uh, add to the educational environment of children who may not even have formal school opportunities. I mean, they even serve the, the Mayan population. And I thought, you know what? Maybe if we had some things, because we're all very bright people and mm. we all have had hope at one point that things could be better. And we've often provided as uh, like Kevin has done so, so often. Here's what I've done and here's how it's working. And here's where it's not working, but here's how it's working. Um, maybe if we had more things like that, we could... Um, get some footholds, make some progress and not feel like it's just a cliff ahead. Um, so that was inspiring and I thought I would share it and it's just getting started and I'm excited about it. Oh, thank you for the invitation to play. Kevin, whenever you'd like. But you will, there you go. Yeah, yeah. two things. Um, you know, on imminent disaster, <laughs> which seems to be a favorite topic of, of this group. And I see imminent disaster here. I see imminent disaster here. Oh my God, this is another reason to be afraid. I almost want to leave this group when, when that becomes the chorus. I remember reminded of the older sister of a friend of mine, and she's been fixing bank software for about 30 years. And it's written in Co COBOL and Fortran. And she doesn't know how it works. And no one will let her figure out how it works. She just have to keep it running. 
And the people who it's lightly documented by scores of programmers years and years ago. And, you know, yet she's retiring and, and there's no one else to do that, but it hasn't blown up yet, you know? Um, and it seems like that's a real imminent disaster and, and we've avoided it, you know? So I firmly believe that, you know, the times are too late and the situation is too dire to be anything other than firmly hopeful. And that's where I go. And I, you know, when, when people want to talk about all these reasons to, another reason for despair. Oh my God, I found another reason for despair. It's like, you know, I, I just, I'm looking for my earplugs, you know, because, you know, it's, it's too late to be anything other than firmly helpful. Yeah, it's hitting the fan. You know, it's been hitting the fan for a while though, you know, we've been doing things that are, you know, uh, a highly clearance. We're not really good, you know, <laughs> and a lot of things happened then. Uh, you know, there were, there were six colonies uh, in the U.S. where you could not preach that uh, Exodus meant let my people go be commodified. You know, it's it's been you know, it's been hitting the fan for a while. You know, so just show the fuck up and stop despairing. That's all I gotta say. Thank you for the kick in the seat, Kevin. You just muted yourself again. Probably that's too harsh, but you know, we really don't have time for fucking despair all the goddamn time. You know, it, it despair is an infection. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, Scott, thanks for the great story. That's a wonderful example of a, of a piece of an island of sanity. Um, I couldn't agree more, um, Kevin. There's no time for despair. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things pointing to collapse, but who knows what's going to happen? Um, remember Y2K? Anybody here remember Y2K? <laughs> so that's an example. So do what you can where you are with what you have. Um, I mean, that's the mantra that that's been kind of driving me. All of us. Um, in some ways are doing good work in the world, whatever it happens to be. And just keep doing that good work with the mindset of um, who knows where this is all going. Um, nobody knows. So let's do the best we can with what we have, um, where we are in the little, in the little projects and the little islands of sanity that we're trying to create. So my, so I think my, two, my two cents. I Can I that, make a I quick think... comment on that about Y2K? Y2K was not a disaster because billions of dollars and millions of person hours were spent making sure it wouldn't be a disaster. It wasn't something we could just, oh, let's not worry about it. It was something that people really focused on and did a lot about. So a lot of people say, oh, Y2K never came to pass as an example of something people worried about that we shouldn't worry about. But it really was something that, that demanded a lot of action and got a lot of action. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ken. And I just want to comment on the on the doom dynamic, which is, I think, I think the emphasis and return emphasis on doom is that just going about business as usual and doing the best we can and adapting as best we can isn't in fact going to be enough. We need to take some dramatic actions. And when Greta Thunberg asks us to, you know, go on a war footing about this, uh, she means that you know economies around the world were changed overnight in order to fight wars, and we're happy to do that for wars. We're just not happy to do that when our futures are at stake. Uh, and it's really hard to convince people to make those kinds of drastic changes. And, and Doug is trying to say, hey, all activity creates carbon. We need to shut down activity. That, that's a gigantic ask. And um, how to get that level of change, that degree of change to happen is, I think, one of the reasons why the conversation keeps just drifting um, emotionally southward. If that's not biased, I don't know. Can you say South anymore? Um, <laughs> um, Mark, then Gil. Uh, Doug, I'll, let me put you in the queue after Gil. So Mark, then Gil, then Doug. I wonder, um, having had like a week-long depressive episode, I had to have a molar pulled about the evolutionary purpose of despair. And yeah, um, 
I'm not sure that despair is a predispect, you know, predisposition predisposition to action. It's a predisposition to withdraw, get away, to basically kind of say, I can't deal. This is something I can't control. So I'm gonna let it go. Um it's you know, all panaceas are poison, you know, basically saying I don't have time for despair. I got time for despair. Despair is part of my life right now. Sorry. Um, but my question was not to, or what I was trying to say about AI and the planet is not to be a doomsayer, but to kind of say, how do I deal with this? How do we deal with this? And I'm sorry if it came across as something that um, felt like doomsaying, because, you know, we all interpret things and, and we all hear things differently. Um, but I don't want to give up on despair yet. I, I kind of, I'm kind of here in grieving. And, you know, it's, it's a personal thing mainly, but basically, you know, my own crisis of grieving is over, feels like. Um, but, you know, there's, I still got to live. I still got to, you know, go to the doctor, get some surgery. And yet there's all this environment around me and the new environment is, you know, AI, the new environment is, you know, cell phones and, and uh, um, uh, maybe bananas are going to go extinct, who knows? I mean, there's you know, all kinds of different things going on. And here we are as, you know, 10, 15, 12, 13 people together um, talking. Where do we go from here is kind of the theme that I'm kind of doing. And I, I salute you, Kevin, for actually doing stuff in the community, which when I was healthy, I actually did. I actually love doing that. And I find that, you know, San Francisco is a better place for the kinds of community work that happens here all the time. Carnival was last weekend. And Los Vandos, I mean, people came up from all over the world to celebrate and be together out in the fog. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't that sunny, but uh, um, don't want to be a doomsayer and don't want to come across as one if that's something that triggered something. Um, thanks. Just thanks. if I could say one quick comment. Um, doomsayer versus telling the truth. That's an important distinction, okay? Because, you know, we've got so many scientists talking about where we are in terms of on the edge of things. Um, so, you know, the idea of um, either Chicken Little running around, you know, the, the, the sky is falling or walking around with our head up to our butts. I don't think either one of those perspectives is um, of great value. Um, two quick comments. One is I think Ken is about to have to take off. And if he has a poem for us, I'd love to hear it. We also have Gil and uh, Doug C uh, in the queue. But also I was thinking, why don't we just alternate formats for the OGM calls and on one set of weeks, we'll all start with a chorus of doom, doom, and some crying. And then on the alternate weeks, we'll start with laughter and joke telling. Sound good? All right. Um, Ken? Sounds great. Yes, I do have a poem. This is from a book of luminous things, an anthology of an international anthology of poetry by Shesla Mishlo. And this is a poem called The Heart of Hercules. Lying under the stars in the summer night, late, while the autumn constellations climb the sky. As the cluster of Hercules falls down the west, I put the telescope by and watch Deneb move towards the zenith. My body is asleep. Only my eyes and brain are awake. The stars stand around me like gold eyes. I can no longer tell where I begin and leave off. The faint breeze in the dark pines and the invisible grass, the tipping earth, storming stars, have an eye that sees itself. Mm. Have a great week, people. See you next week. Thank, Thank you so much, Ken. Again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Gil, then Doug C is going to have the final word, then we'll wrap the call. Yeah, um, sorry to come late, uh, but I'm um, fascinated by what I walked into. Um, Mark, uh, grief strikes me as really important. 
and this culture doesn't like it and tries to medicate it. And, um, you know, I, I think grief is really different than depression. Um, grief is real, so there's that. Um, what you described as the despair of there's nothing I can do, so I'm gonna let it go, doesn't strike me as despair. That strikes me as serenity and maybe a sense of wonder of like, I don't know, let's see what happens next. Um, <clears throat> the question that wrote, uh, the question that rose to me, I came in in the middle of Kevin's uh, uh, wonderful rant there. Uh, and the question that it raises for me is who is served by despair? And particularly who is served by the propagation of despair? You know, who, who benefits from despair being cultivated in us, the kind of despair that leads to inaction, not to letting go of certain things. And, uh, you know, as Kevin said, getting the fuck on with it, with other things. Um, Greta's not living in despair. She's, you know, she's freaked out by the danger, uh, but she's not surrendering to despair. And I, I, I like that model. And Kevin, I'm going to quote you once again. Dr. Hamilton, whenever you'd like. I think that the issue is how do you liberate radical imagination for coping with a crisis? And not facing the crisis in its full dimension is not helpful to getting the radical kind of imagination we need. I found that the painting that I described really liberated me because I took something that was deep, put it out, uh, and then immediately I could start thinking about, okay, what do we do? Uh, and things have come from that. So anyway, that's my thought off for the day. I appreciate that. And I think that was a good tip upward um, at the end of our conversation today. Um, thanks, everybody. I uh, appreciate your presence very much. And um, see you on the intertubes. <laughs>